127. A few pages over, number 127. This afternoon, number 149. 149. 
Alright, good afternoon. Okay, I guess this thing's on. Good to go. Thank you, Sawyer. Um, so I got, uh, you guys got the, the rookie tonight, or this afternoon, as I just said. But um, I'm going to read, I typically, when I, I do preach, I, as my habit is, I get an article online and I just kind of make fun of it. So that's, and I picked out, this is an article I read um, at my last church. Um, I think it's, the date on here is 2018, so I guess that's when I preached it last, so, I, um, or sometime around then. But, um, so, this is 10 things for parents uh, to never say to your children. So, for you, those of you that are parents, maybe you can get some, some uh, good parenting advice from Yahoo News. So, <laughs> wait, why are you guys laughing? <laughs> so, uh, the first, the first thing, I, when I re- read this initially, I guess I didn't have kids, so now I'll see how how bad I've been doing as a parent. <laughs> See if I've said some of these things. Um, first thing is leave me alone. So don't ever tell your kids that. That can be, it says, sure, you want some times you want a moment of peace without your children, but don't, you know, don't say that. That can be detrimental to them. Just, just tell them you need a few moments of solitude. <laughs> so, so there's better wording for you. I need a few moments of solitude. This one's, uh, this one's good. You're okay. Don't ever tell your kid you're okay. <laughs> it says, no matter the extent of their injury, even a small scrape can be traumatic for your child. Traumatic. A small scrape. <laughs> so playing the gruff parent and brushing it off is only going to make the situation worse. Really. <laughs> and then at the, it says a few other things. They're supposed to be, feel protected. It says, isn't that your job in the first place? Come on. Don't, don't, don't tell them they're okay. Coddle to their, their little bratty needs and... And we just got the opposite advice from that from our pastor a week, two weeks ago. He said, <laughs> let them cry it out. But just don't even go to them. Just, you're fine. <laughs> so so I, that's why I, when I uh, was going through and I saw this, I was looking through some old messages. I saw this and I was like, this is perfect. We're kind of going over parenting so we can compare it with our pastor's um, <laughs> advice. <laughs> um, you're supposed to never say, this is not the place for this discussion. So don't reprimand. It says, sure, you don't want to reprimand your chi- children in public, but you save that awkward exchange for, for fewer sparse spectators. And so it's like you're taking the home and turning it, it's not a place of peace anymore. The kid's going to be all in turmoil when he gets home. He's going to, I don't know, wet his bed or something. Um, don't be so greedy. So don't tell them not to be greedy. That could be, that could hurt them. Uh, it says, uh, let's see, this might slip through. It says, uh, where's the part I was trying to look for? The fear of being too greedy, this can damage your child's relationship with the concept of greed and fairness. For the fear of being too greedy, they may unnecessarily limit their spending and have difficulty placing value on things they own. So they, they won't be an American if you <laughs> tell them to not be greedy. <laughs> and they, they will, they'll, you know, they might limit their spending. What, like, what, <laughs> what kind of concept is that? <laughs> uh, here's one. You're a liar. Well, if they're being a liar, call them a liar <laughs> no, no. and get, get onto them and spank them after that. <laughs> no. uh, it says, even if they did lie about something, this accusatory tone is only going to make your child feel you are personally attacking them. Uh, it says, instead, feel why they felt the need to lie. So why, why did you feel the need to lie? I, I never got that talk with, from my parents. It was, a, it was a spanking and much worse. So, uh, and and m- more wor- worse things were said than <laughs> you're a liar. <laughs> no. Um, let's see, next we have stop being so bossy. This one's good. Well, this, this one can, apl- uh, can apply to both genders. It's a phrase that can be especially harmful to females. You didn't know that. <laughs> Reprimanding your daughter for being too bossy is one thing, but it's a whole other issue if you're constantly telling them to stop being assertive. I mean, she already has so many more obstacles in her path than that of her male counterparts. So why convince her to be less tenacious and outspoken? when these traits can only help her achieve greatness further down the line. So you, you want your daughter to be tenacious and outspoken, I guess. I don't want my daughter to be tenacious. I want to be a submissive wife one day, Lord willing. <laughs> so, so I would go 100% opposite of that, of course. Um, because I said so. We heard that in preaching recently. He said it's not maybe, tell them it's right, but you can say that too. Because I said so. <laughs> don't say that. Let's see if there's, this is the one I, I, with their description, I kind of ag- I agree with. It says, don't say, don't make me turn the car around. 
if you're not actually going to do it, which I agree with that. Don't tell your kids, don't make me turn the car around, and then it's just an idle threat that doesn't mean anything. So that was, hey, they had one, one good one right there. And then here, this is, this is a horrible advice from Yahoo. Don't talk to strangers. Don't tell your kids not to talk to strangers because this can be a confusing command for children to understand. They may take this too far and distrust even the, the only strangers that can help them in a dangerous situation. Just try to keep better track of your kids. Start with that. And then <laughs> but yeah, don't, t don't tell them not to talk to strangers. You want them to talk to any, any creeper out there. So, so there's your, uh, your advice from Yahoo News on parenting. So hopefully you guys got a blessing from that. And uh, like I said, you can take that and compare it with the, the teaching we've been getting or the preaching on Sunday morning. So, all right. Uh, so this message, I, uh, as I kind of was talking about, I preached this message once before. So I think Essa and Annalise were probably there at Open Door when I preached it, and my wife. So you get a rerun. Um, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. I tried to work up a new message that I had not preached before, something that I had um, starting from, from scratch, so to speak, and it was like beating my head against the wall, and I finally just, the Lord <laughs> made it clear I wasn't supposed to do that, and started going through old messages, and uh, didn't know if this was the one, and finally got a verse to confirm that, so I believe this is what the Lord had me to preach tonight. Um, very common passage, you guys have all, uh, I'm sure, heard a message of some sort or a teaching, um, and this uh, story that Jesus Christ tells in Matthew chapter 21 and starting in verse 28. And, um, but I'll just try to look at it maybe a little differently. It won't maybe do, I mean, not maybe anything brand new, but uh, just some, some thoughts that we'll try to pull from the, this passage here. Um, before I get started, let's, let's go ahead and say a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we, uh, we do thank you, God, for being able to meet this afternoon. And God, uh, we thank you for the word of God. Uh, we thank you for the truth um, that... God, we have a reason to meet, and uh, God, we thank you for the instruction we were even given this morning, God, and that we need to give attendance to reading and to the doctrines of this word, and um, God, we pray that you would come down and meet with us this afternoon, and uh, God, just uh, use this uh, simple message, God, uh, to maybe just glorify yourself, and uh, God, we also just pray for our pastor as he's away, we pray that... Uh, You'd be encouraged uh, through the meetings and the things going on uh, down there in Florida. And just get him back safely here and um, just bless his trip. And, uh, God, we just pray for all the things that are done the rest of this day on this Sunday and that we would honor and glorify you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So Matthew chapter 21, um, I will title this uh, message, so you don't have to ask me later, Intentions vs. Action. So... Intentions versus action. So, uh, verse 28, we'll start and we'll read this couple verses here. Uh, but what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father, they say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that publicans and harlots uh, shall go lost my spot, har harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. And we'll just stop right there. Um, so you have two different brothers here. Um, like I said, common passage. And so I want to take, their, you can break down the differences between them and what, what caused the outcome of, of one doing the will of the Father and one not. Um, but before I even do that, I want to look at their similarities. Um, you have a few things that line them up when I mean, they both had the same father. Um, so the same upbringing, uh, the same start. Um, you, I mean, there can be differences within a home, but it's going to be pretty similar. Um, and then you have, you have that they both had the same calling. They both were called by the father to go into the field and work. Um, but one does and one doesn't. And you have... Um, you have different, um, you know, Christians that some are going to go do right and some aren't. You'll have them in the same church, could be from the same family, could be from the, there's no necessarily outwardly, I mean, there's going to be differences, but no main difference. But you see one, someone does right and someone doesn't. And, and you see what is, what is the cause and what is, why would one do right and one do, uh, doesn't. And so we want to look at that 
So first we'll look at the younger brother. I'll break down a few things for him. It's, uh, the first thing, uh, I believe the younger brother, brother was pressured to say that he would go. So that could be a, a, a possibility, I should say. Um, he just saw the father talk to the older brother. And he says, I will not. He see, maybe he saw the outcome of what took place after that. Maybe the father was frustrated. It turned into an argument. You never know what could have transpired there. Maybe he just felt bad for the dad. Maybe he saw the father and he was hurt by his son's response. And so maybe, you know, I, I should probably have a different response. Maybe he didn't have as much leeway to get away with the, what the older brother did. Sometimes, I mean, growing up with a bunch of brothers, you see sometimes what one brother can get away with, you might not be able to. <laughs> so, um, and so maybe it was that. But for whatever reason, he follows it up, and he says the right thing, and he says, I will go. And so he sa- he's at least uh, feels the pressure to talk the talk, so to speak, to play the part. And many times a Christian can feel that, feel that need because of other Christians or because of, uh, things going on that they, they say the right things or do the right things on the outward appearance, but don't follow through with the end goal. Uh, don't f- stay faithful to the Lord. Um, so you have, uh, <clears throat> turn, turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. So we're in Matthew just a little over a few pages earlier. Another you know, thing you could have been thinking is, the father only came to me because... He already asked the older brother, and he said no. So there's kind of an out. But he felt the pressure to at least speak up and say, you know, say the right thing. I go, sir. I'll go work in the field. And so you see a mark of someone that feels the pressure to do things because of others uh, is, is, or an attribute is very fickle. And you see that here in Matthew chapter 14. You see it in verse 3. Let's read a couple of verses here. It says, And Herod had laid hold on John, and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And he would have put him to death. He feared the multitude, or he would, yeah, he would have put him to death. He feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. And so it looks almost like, and this is a, I've seen this many times, where if a a man is extremely fickle, a lot of times it's because he's run by his wife, is what comes down to it. And you see right here, he makes this decision based off of what? Uh, in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, because he was, had some relations with her. And so he, he does it, puts him in prison because of her. Then he would have killed her, but he doesn't because of the people. And then you keep reading on. And in uh, verse 8, she, he has this woman come in, dance before him. Um, you have, he says, uh, and he gives her whatever you, you, know, you ask, I'll give you. In verse 8, he says, And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in prison. So he only does it again because <laughs> of the pressure of the people. And so he's just going back and forth on what he should do with John the Baptist. And he's making decisions based off of those around him. And so... Uh, You don't want to be the Christian that falls into that trap of you making decisions. I mean, sometimes a Christian will stay in church, which is not a bad thing, but only because of what other people will think. Only because of what are what are the brethren going to think if I fall out of church? Or they're only and it's that's their motive for all the decisions they make, and they're moving places because of the pressure of a wife or because of this or that, and making all these decisions. and And it's the mark of a fickle Christian. So it's possible that the brother here in this passage, which you can turn back there only did it because he felt the pressure. The other possibility, which I think is probably the most likely, is that he planned to go into the field that day. I think he, he planned to. When he said, I go, sir, I think he meant it at that time. Um, and, and there was a plan. He probably figured, you know, he would go out in the field a little later in the day. He would, he would maybe kill a little time. It would, still, it would still be more than his brother was doing. His brother is not going at all, and I was kind of second option anyhow, so... I'll go out in the field when I find some time, and I'll go. And so he says the right thing, and it sounds good, and, but it never, it never comes to pass. And so many times, and I think this is more the intent is what I'm talking about, I think most Christians that are in church, I'll say, have good intentions. They have good intentions to do right. Uh, they have good intentions to be faithful to church. They have good intentions to start praying every day. A good, that's a good intention. There's a desire, a right desire. That's not a, that's not a bad thing. 
um, a good intention to study the Bible maybe more faithfully, to read their Bible every day, to be a better husband, a better wife, a better father or mother. And all of these things, they're good intentions and they're good things. But what happens if you only have good intentions? Good intentions don't get you anywhere. <laughs> good intentions are a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But if it never turns into action, it's worth nothing. You know, and, and so, I mean, I, growing up in, in a, in a Bible-believing church and growing up around a bunch of youth group kids, I saw so many kids over the years hit the altar and cry their eyes out at camp and at different things. And there was, an, there was a desire deep down in there that wanted to do right. Because being around the Bible, being around preaching, being around good parents, there's a desire in there. But you look, I, I have a picture somewhere. I, I haven't found it lately since moving and everything. But I have a picture somewhere of the first trip that I went with my youth group. And there's about 40, 45 of us kids. And I literally, every single one of those kids I've seen at camp hit the altar and cry and you know, say they want to do right, want to serve the Lord. And there's probably three people out of those 45 kids that are serving the Lord today. How does, how does that happen? I think at one point there was a good intention. There was a desire. There's something that's pulling them towards the Lord, but there's also that pull of the world, and, and, and they never turn it into action of serving the Lord. And what a good intention does is it, it makes plans, but it never does anything further than that. And that's all it is is a plan. You know, th there's some things in life that you don't need to plan, okay? <laughs> I don't need to plan to go to work next week. I'm going to work next week. I mean, by God's grace, obviously, right? But I'm not going to say, you know, I think next week I'm, I'm going to work. No, nope. <laughs> no, I'm going to work. I might make plans surrounded with work, right? I might plan some things out in the work week, but I'm not, okay, I got to, I better put that on the schedule. I got to work. No, it's, it's going to happen, right? You have to do it. It's, it's expected. It's, there, there is no, you don't have to put all this forethought into it, if you should or if you shouldn't. And the same goes for the Lord. You, you make plans to get something right. And you never will with just a plan. <laughs> a plan, if that's all it ever is, it never... No, you take action. You have to. You have to take some action and say, I will do this. <laughs> I'm, I'm, and do it. And just make it happen. As long as there is a plan to do something, the devil's fine with you having a plan of starting something a little down the road. Starting it tomorrow. Starting it, making a plan. I'm going to do this. When, and, I, and, it's, and it's funny how the flesh will deceive you. I've been guilty of it myself. I remember when I was... Around eighth grade, I was playing basketball and wanting to play for the high school, the local high school. And I literally, in my mind, I didn't want to not serve the Lord. I wanted to serve the Lord. But I knew that if I played basketball, I wouldn't be as church as faithfully. And there were was, was certain things. If I, if I started freshman year, I was going to play all the way through high school. And, and I was like, well, I'll just, I'll just not maybe serve the Lord as much during that time. And then after that, I'll go to Bible school and I'll do all that after. And... You literally start making plans in your head of what you're going to do down the road when it comes to the Lord. No, you're going to do it now or you're not going to do it. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. Um, and it, it's, like I said, it goes for any of these things, creating a habit to pray. You just have to do it. You have to get down and pray. You have to, every morning, this is part of my schedule. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read my Bible, and I'm going to do it. It's that simple. It's not, okay, I just heard a message on prayer again. Yeah, and I'm not, still don't got that prayer life like I should. Tomorrow, I'll start praying. Well, you just made a plan for a future day that will never come to pass. No, no, you pray that night, and then you do it tomorrow, and then you continue in it. You turn it into action right away. You don't, you know, I mean, Americans are great. Every year, it's, you know, New Year's resolution. By the New Year's, I'm going to start doing this. Really? <laughs> if you won't do it now, you're not going to do it by the New Year's. You might do it for a little bit, but it's, it, never, it never results in anything lasting. And so, as long as you have a good intent and a plan, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for you. Uh, turn to Hebrews 12, and you'll see a good example of this, of someone who intended to get right, who had a plan. There was a desire, but it never happened. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and look at verse 17. You guys all know the story of Esau. Uh, look at verse 17. Uh, it says his name in verse 16 for context's sake, but we'll read verse, start in verse 17. It says, For when ye know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And see, it bothered him. 
It wasn't as if being bothered by the Holy Spirit, being bothered that you should do something better, that's good. But that's, that, that doesn't really do anything for you if it never turns into action. He didn't find any place for repentance. And if you never get to that point of making a decision to repent or make a decision to do, to do this better or to stop doing this, it, it'll never happen. It'll just be an illusion that you're going to one day. And, and so you have to be careful with just intentions because they make you feel good for a little bit, but it doesn't turn into anything. And um, I won't turn there, but in Proverbs 5, it talks about getting holden with the cords of his sin. A man who, you know what happens? You have this intent to get it right, but while you procrastinate, that cord is being wrapped around you. And that's what happened with Esau. And he never finds place for repentance. Um, the devil will just keep put you putting it off. Turn over to Acts chapter 24 and you see another uh, example of this. But just the flesh telling you to put it off a little longer. You'll make a plan and it, and it never comes to place. Um, Acts chapter 24. Look at verse 24. <clears throat> you guys all know this story as well. It says, And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. And so you, you see that he's bothered. He's trembling. Uh, there's some conviction there. And, and what happens? He says, Go thy way for this time. Implying that next time he's going to get saved. He had a plan next time. For this time, but next time when there's a convenient season, it's going to happen. And, and it never t takes place. You keep reading that passage, we won't, but he leaves Paul bound later. It never looks like he, you never have any account of him, of him getting saved or getting, getting right in any capacity. And that's just the, the deception of your flesh to put it off for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> you know, another thing you don't see in the passage, it never... Uh, you have the, the older brother, it says, and afterward he repented. You don't know that the younger brother ever saw the older brother go into the field. And so you know what? He, could, he always had that justification in the back of his mind. The older brother didn't go. He told the father no, and he never went. And so then, why, why should I go? At least I, try, I, you know, I had planned, so I'm still better than him. <laughs> and, and see, you'll, you'll make up this scenario where there's someone that's not doing it. At least I made plans to do right. At least I intended to do right. You know, people say, common saying, he means well. well what, what does that mean? That means he's doing a sorry job of whatever he's doing. He means well. You know, it's not, nothing's actually good taking place there. <laughs> um, and, and that's just kind of, you know, the way we talk and the way we, we act. Um, you know, you have the, uh, the example of, of Christ talking to calling some people to come and follow him. And he says, what? Let me first go and bury my father. You know, let me, let me first do this. And that's the, the person that has the intent. There's always one thing that you need to do that's more important than the thing that you should be doing. <laughs> In your mind, you need to do. There's always one thing. It's, you know, oh, I need to sit down and read my Bible. Up, oh, I should probably send off that email for work. It's getting behind. And then you get on your email or you know what you're looking at, where, Wayfair ad, and you're like, 95% off, what am I doing? No. <laughs> no, you know what happens? You put off for one thing that you thought you had to do, right? And it's, it, that's what it becomes. It becomes, there's always one excuse. The devil puts one little thought or your flesh and goes, hey, you've got to do this first. And then, you, and then it never happens. And it, you, that one thing leads to all these other things, and, and, and the fallout never takes place. Um, <clears throat> Next, the next thing, this would kind of go in succession with the younger brother, is, you know, if he, he made a plan, but eventually that plan becomes less and less important to even get right. And this is a scary place to, to be, but a Christian will eventually get pleased and just get comfortable and get content where they're at. And the, the desire of getting it right just becomes less and less. And he gets comfortable to the point where he never goes out into the field. He never follows through with what the Father asked him to do. Um, <clears throat> you have the example in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. You have Saul who uh, doesn't kill all the animals and keeps some of them for sacrifice because of the people, because he feared the people. And, and Samuel comes and rebukes him. And, he, and nevertheless, I know, and you, you know what he says to Samuel, pardon me, 
You know what he's more concerned with? He's more concerned with what it's that Samuel pardons, pardons him and not God. Even after Samuel's like, the kingdom's rent from you, and saying, he's, you pardon me and let us go and in front of the people. And he becomes so comfortable in his sin that he, the, the plan to get right isn't even there. He's getting <laughs> rebuked that the kingdoms will be taken from him, and he only cares about right then. He only cares about the people right around him. And, you know, that's a, a scary place for a Christian. It's, a, it's, a, it's like dealing with a lost person that has no idea or no plan. When you talk to them, there's no care to get right. Um, <clears throat> next, moving on to the older brother, give a few things for him. The first thing you have for him is he's adamant. You see that, obviously, in the passage. His response is what? I will not. <laughs> I will not. That's pretty plain. <laughs> no questioning where he stands. Um, this obviously doesn't look like a good start for someone who's going to end right. And, you know, at times, you're going to be either one of these brothers. You're going to be the Christian that has plans to do right, and you don't follow through with it. And there's going to be sometimes you... <laughs> clearly go against the Lord, and you know it. And, you know, it says, and afterward he repented. It doesn't say how much time afterward had passed, but he obviously lost some time. He lost some hours in the day to work in the Father's field. And, and afterward he did repent. Praise the Lord, he did come to a point of repentance, um, but there was some time that was lost. I think the main thing that you see here that is good, you can draw from a, a negative response, is his honesty. And God wants you to be honest. <laughs> um, I think Christians get so used to almost playing the part amongst Christians that they do that same thing with the Lord and, and aren't, aren't completely honest with the Lord. When the Lord knows your heart, you just kind of say the things you think you should say. And you kind of brush over the issues that you, you want to avoid. <laughs> and you've got to be honest with God. You have a great example of that in Jeremiah. You know, he says, it's your fault <laughs> that I'm, I'm in the state I am. You deceive me. And the Lord gets him right. And, and so God... Um, appreciate some honesty. And honestly, amongst men, we appreciate honesty. <laughs> when I'd rather someone tell me, I will not, when you ask them to do something, than say, I go and never do anything. <laughs> um, I'd be, you might initially be like, well, he's a jerk, and then, <laughs> then you move on. But the person that you're like counting on, expecting him, okay, he's going to go, I don't need to get anyone else, he's going to do the job, he said he would, and then doesn't follow through. And that's the unfaithful man. And so it's best always if you're honest. So you see that, and you see, because of that, he gets affected, and <clears throat> it opens up with the Lord to deal with him, his honesty. And a lot of times, I think sometimes, kind of reading into this passage again in Matthew 21, you have that uh, the Lord will use sometimes a backslidden Christian to get you right. And, you know, he saw probably that he had an effect on his younger brother by saying, I will not, and then his younger brother said he would, but then never goes out into the field. And... You have, uh, turn with me to Genesis 38. This is just an example of someone using someone that's not really, I wouldn't consider a, a, not justified in their position, but the Lord uses it to deal with someone that it has sinned. But you see in Genesis 38, look with me, um, start in verse 12. This is, this is Judah and Tamar, if you know the passage. Start in verse 12, it says, In the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted, and went up unto his sheep shears in Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put her widow's garments off from her, and covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in the open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot, because she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way, and said, Go, I pray thee, uh, go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? And he said, I will give thee a kid of the flock. And she said, What wilt thou give me a pledge, till thou send it? And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. And then you skip down to uh, verse 24. Finds out she's pregnant. It came to pass about, uh, about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. 
And Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burnt. So <laughs> heart comes down hard. <laughs> bring her forth, let her be burnt. She's, she's with child. And, and um, she was brought forth and she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, discern, I pray thee, who's the signet and the bracelets and staff? And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because I, that I gave her not to Sheila, my son. And he knew her again, no more. And you see, he, he's affected by it and says, She's more righteous than I. And I don't think she was all in the right here and everything that played out. Um, but he's acknowledging his sin. And the Lord sometimes will use almost a backslidden Christian to, to deal with you. And I think that's what happened with the brother. He see, sees his brother doesn't go on the field and he says, That's my job anyhow. I should have been setting the example. I should have been going into the field to work. And so then you have, he comes to the place where he atones. In Matthew 21, you see he repents. Um, let me just turn back there. I'm not quite there just to read it. Matthew 21. It says, uh, <clears throat> he answered and said, I will not, in verse 29, but afterward he repented and went. And he goes into the field. And, you know, he, like I said, he, he probably lost some time, but he acknowledged his mistake and he repents. And at times there's going to be, have to be a time where you repent. Where you acknowledge when you screwed up and you repent. And you get it right. I had something this past week that I did that was just stupid. <laughs> I won't go into details. And I had to repent to my wife. Because <laughs> she didn't want me to do it. And I was like, nope. Being a bullheaded, red-blooded male, nope, this is it's the right decision. <laughs> and then, you know, you come to that place, especially with my wife, who's she's not the easiest to repent to. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> But you, you know, and it's one of those things, you got to do it, right? You got to get to that place. It's humbling and you have to acknowledge. But obviously I had to repent to the Lord first. That's what it came down to. I had to say sorry to him for the mistake and then go to my wife and, and apologize. And there's going to be, have to be, you can never be too prideful to come to that place like the elder brother, realizing he screwed up, realizing the effect that he had on his younger brother and what he should have been doing in the field for his father. And he repents. And let the Lord deal with you and have some true repentance. Um, you have the example in uh, Luke 15 with the prodigal son. You know, he's sitting there and humility comes with true repentance. And he's sitting there, you know, I, there's servants that are getting treated better than I am. Uh, if I can just go be a servant, I'll be happy in my father's house. And I love the, the wording there. It says, and he came to himself. <laughs> just come, realize and come to himself because sometimes you've got to wake yourself up, you know. Come to yourself, what am I doing? This is a horrible, I'm, I just, you know, the, the backslidden Christian continues to convince himself that he's having a good time. That's, that's half of their life, is trying to convince, this is, I'm enjoying this, I'm having a good time, this is right, I'm having fun, and the whole time it's just, it's misery. Until you come to that place and you come to yourself and you say, what are you doing? Wake up. And, and you see the prodigal son that does that. And kind of interesting, the story of the prodigal son, it's, it's the, the younger brother that repents and the older brother that, you know, says the right things but never follows through, and it's the opposite in this story. And so there's really, you know, a lot of times Christians, I mean, it's not just Christians, it's this society, it's everyone blames their upbringing or the way they're raised or the things that happen to them, the hard, you know, hard luck they've had to excuse the way they're living. And it doesn't matter where you fall in line. It doesn't matter your start. One's going to do right and one's not. And that's what it comes down to. I, I understand those things have an effect on you. I'm not saying that. There's trouble that has an effect on you. But that doesn't determine if you serve the Lord or not. Um, you, you take the example of Josiah, someone who starts out who has no good start. His father's worshiping idols. His grandfather's Manasseh, the most wicked king. Uh, of Israel, and you know what he does at eight years old? He starts cleansing the land, and he says, I'm going to do right, and he serves the Lord. He didn't have a good example of a father or grandfather or anyone else around him that you could see until after he starts doing right, he gets some help, but he decides, I'm going to do right. And, and so there's not, there is no excuse for why you didn't go into the field. There is no excuse for, well, I had the right intentions. You know, I planned to go into the field. I, I wanted to. It just didn't happen. You know, uh, give you six things that uh, in good intentions are. Here's the truth about them. Number one, they're not decisions, just illusions of decisions. They're never a decision. It's, it's I plan to make this decision. <laughs> they release you from guilt, but never take it any further. 
Number three, they're all about the future and never connected to the now. That's what a good intention is. It's, it's I'll do this then. Uh, they're accountable to no one except yourself. They promise much, require little, but accomplish nothing. And lastly, they are a facilitator to procrastination. And that's what good intentions are. There's nothing wrong with good intentions, but that's, if that's it, you have nothing. And like I said, Christians are full of good intentions. Some of you probably have some good intentions, and you've had them for quite a while, but have never turned into anything more. Um, there's whatever it is, whatever the Lord's deal with, dealt with you about. I mean, don't you hate that when there's that one thing that's preached about, and every time the Lord deals with you about it? And, and right then you have a good intention saying, ah, oh, I should get that right. And then you never do it. You don't have to sit through a service when that thing's preached and be uncomfortable. <laughs> you can make a decision and actually do something and take it into action and, and serve the Lord. Do what, whatever it is. You can get that thing right or been wavering if you should really sell out to the Lord. And just sell out. <laughs> make that decision and make it final and quit putting off and quit justifying yourself because of a good intention. There, in the, none of those good intentions, you can have all the good intentions in the world. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, it means nothing. You're not going to tell the Lord, well, I, I intended to serve you. <laughs> I intended to get this thing right. And if it never happens, it means nothing. And it means nothing to Him. It might look good on the outward appearance. It might sound good when you say it to other Christians. But if it never turns anything, it means nothing. And maybe, you know, maybe you're the older brother who says no. And you've, you've told the Lord no. The Lord's called you to preach or called you to do something. You've told the Lord no, and you've put it off. Or something the Lord's pegged in your heart and says, get this right. You've said no, and you've never done anything about it. There's still time to repent. It doesn't matter how much time that you've wasted. There's still some work to do in the field, I promise. <laughs> there's still something for you, a job for you to do in the field. No matter if it's the last hour of the day, there's a job. And the Father's coming by once again, and he's, at, and he's calling on people, and he's saying, will you work today in my field? You come work today in the field? And some, some will say no, and hopefully get it right one day. No promises. And some of you are sitting there saying, yeah, I, I want to do that. I want to do something for the Lord. I, I, I would love to do that. And then you don't do it. it. It's time to make a decision and turn it into action. It's, it's time to quit putting off and holding to those intentions and, and, and sell out to the Lord. <laughs> Give it to Him. Turn it into action. You know, today I'm going to start whatever it is. Um, there's no reason to put it off any longer. Uh, let's go ahead and say a word of prayer. Lord, I just pray that uh, you'd use uh, just this simple message, God, to speak to someone. Uh, God, I know how deceptive the flesh is and how we tend to put things off and how our intentions uh, get in the way of what you're trying to do. And so I just pray that uh, maybe one would uh, make a decision and, and act, God, on what you're just dealing with them about. God, I don't know, you know the different hearts and different people and where they're at, uh, but God, maybe one would, would, God, turn it into action and do something that you've been dealing with them about. We thank you, God, once again for the truth of your words and uh, just a simple story that your son spoke that uh, we can draw some things from. And I pray that just do a work here today, and uh, God, just we pray that you'd bless the rest of this uh, afternoon and evening, and uh, God, that uh, you'd be lifted up in the things we do and say. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here, we might as well sing for a little bit, right? <laughs> All righty. Does anybody have any requests? We haven't been doing them lately this afternoon or in the afternoons, but does anybody have any requests they'd like to sing? Right off the bat, put everybody else on the spot. <laughs> no requests. <laughs> yep, I, I, I know. <laughs> I'm with you. What was it? Two ninety nine. 
That is the limit of my capabilities on piano. <laughs> Alrighty, day by day, ready? Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure Gives unto each day what he deems best Lovingly it's part of pain and pleasure Mingling toil with peace and rest Every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour all my cares he fain would bear and cheer me he whose name is counselor and power the protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid as thy days thy strength shall be in measure this the pledge to me he made help me then in every tribulation so to trust thy promises o lord that i lose not face sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word help me lord when toil and trouble meeting ere to take as from a father's hand one by one the days the moments fleeting till i reach the promised land good singing that was a good message this afternoon as well john that's uh really good because <laughs> intentions are everywhere absolutely everywhere um one thing i read recently i forgot who it was it was either gates or jobs or one of those guys that you know gets super successful you know one of those kind of people and he said i forgot who it was but basically they were talking about the key to focus is saying no i was like that doesn't make sense and i thought about it for a little bit it's like if you have intentions to pray you have intentions to read, you have intentions to focus on, you know, doing right. The key to that is saying no to all the other stuff that's going to come in and try to take you from that. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. I get it now. The key to focusing and getting done spiritually what needs to be get done is not just saying I will do that, but saying, no, I'm not going to do this, that, or the other thing that will keep me from doing that. So say I go not when it comes to that stuff. <laughs> But when you say, I go, remember, say, you have to say no along the way to everything else that will jump in. So that was really good. That was really good. So, all right, let's, uh, let's be dismissed and then have a good rest of your afternoon. Have a good rest of your week. And uh, be praying for these folks traveling and uh, just the church in general. It's been a blessing. It's been really sweet, I think. Um, it's, it's been good. So thanks for your attentive, attentiveness this afternoon, this morning. You guys are dismissed.